What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this episode of the Copy Blogger Podcast, where I have a, I think maybe our first returning guest, oh. Matt, the famous Matt McGarry, which actually this is going to work out really well because the last time Matt was on the show, he interviewed with Tim and I had to miss that episode. So now I'm back with Matt and we are going to, we're, we're here to do like a little bit of a lightning round because Matt's got some pretty cool news. He, uh, for anybody who hasn't met him before, is a growth marketer focused specifically on newsletter growth. Um, your company, I don't know if you've been public about what it's called, Grow Letter, right? Are you, yeah. are you, I know I have an agency that right now? So it's an agency focused on newsletter growth. Yep. Awesome. And uh, the cool news, the reason that we just had to like jump on here in order to talk about something very timely is uh, Matt was integral in the growth of uh, Milk Road, which started early this year uh, in 2022 and basically was just acquired. So this has to be some kind of record. They grew from zero to 250,000 subscribers inside of a year. Uh, the ad work that Matt did, uh, was responsible for about 80% of that list growth. And then obviously acquired towards the later part of the year. I'm not sure. I think that might be the fastest, uh, exit of a newsletter that I've ever seen so far. So congratulations, first of all, for, for all the success on your team, dude. Um, but we just wanted to come in here, talk about some of the growth stuff, talk about some of the ad stuff and uh, capture this moment really quick. So welcome in. Yeah, thank you. I think it's really interesting because like anytime there's a newsletter acquisition, the space is so small. So everybody talks a ton about it. And this one is just so cool because it happens so quickly. Like 10 months, I think is the official number that um, they put out there. I don't know exactly, but somewhere around there, well under a year. The growth was super fast. Obviously, a ton of people listening like know of the content and really enjoy the content. That's that's a big part of what helped us grow so fast too. So it's really interesting to see. So yeah, I'll kind of break down maybe like I started working with them in January. So I can kind of break down like what we did then, what we did kind of throughout the year. I'll be using like broads. I can't go into super detail, of course, um, but I think it'll be like a really interesting case study for people listening. But yeah, okay, so let's do it. I like um, Sean and Ben reached out to me in like late January of this year. Uh, or actually, no, I reached out to them. So opposite of that, um, I was working also all the time. They became my first kind of newsletter growth client. I kind of pitched them on doing um, paid ads. So we started doing Facebook ads and TikTok ads. We later tested other stuff, which I'll talk about. You know, not surprisingly, those are some of the best growth sources up for us for Facebook and TikTok ads. Kind of like we did with the hustle. Facebook was a huge growth source of the hustle probably um, got us almost the majority of our subscribers there like historically. So that's kind of the same thing we did. Like at first we started kind of using similar creative and messaging to what the hustle did. Like it was not super original at the time. Um, we were using testimonials. We were using memes like the hustle. We were using TikTok style videos and we were able to scale Facebook pretty quickly. And then also later scale TikTok once we kind of got our video creative on one point. So to break down like more exactly what that looks like and how people can kind of replicate similar results on Facebook. So one, we're all just, I'll just kind of break through the, the Facebook campaign and how I recommend people set up a Facebook campaign for a newsletter. So we're using conversion ads. So driving traffic to a landing page. We were actually using the, the default Beehive landing page, which like looks like a Substack landing page. It was like a title, a subheadline, and a form. And that was it. And basically the entire time we just used that landing page. We made some changes with the copy, but like we did not build a lot of fancy landing pages or do A-B testing. That worked very well. Um, so we we're driving traffic to that page using conversion ads. We started targeting like pretty broad audiences. That's what seemed to work best. So audiences like people who were like 21 to 45, people who were you know 23 plus, like very broad audiences worked well because at the time crypto was like an interest so many people had and they were kind of desperate for more information. So the broad stuff worked a lot better. We were able to get really low CPMs, which was cost per 1,000 impressions on Facebook because of those really broad um, audiences. We were also testing stuff like targeting other business influencers. So like crypto related influencers like Elon Musk or um, what's the other guy? Mark, I'm forgetting some, but Elon Musk, Gary Vee, and there's one other that worked pretty well. Like anybody who's like in crypto, you know, we can target them on Facebook. We obviously targeted them. We also targeted a bunch of other like financial publications. And this works well for pretty much any newsletter that is in like the financial or business or tech space. You're going to want to target other publications who are like somewhat similar to you. So we did a lot of that too. Hmm. So that was targeting lots of broad audiences. Um, pause me if you have any stuff. 
Oh, I have just one quick comment on the broad audience work. So I've seen somebody else recommend this recently as well, broad audience targeting on Facebook. And he says that he's getting lower CPMs with that as well. His justification is that Facebook is getting better and better at serving up ads to the right people. So the way he kind of positions it is he says, just go broad and try a lot of ads and then trust Facebook to get those ads in front of the people who are going to click them. What's, what's your thought on that? Yeah, that's kind of my philosophy too. They're very good that they have their algorithms and all that stuff to figure it out. So kind of let them do whenever they can do the job for you, let them do it. So broad targeting, um, use automatic bidding instead of manual bidding, let them do the job because they'll be able to do the best results for you. And like look like audiences, for example, which are more niche audiences just didn't work as well for us and are not overall for all the newsletters I work with look like audiences are not working as well as they used to. Hmm. Uh, and broad is much better. So like if anyone has a Facebook ad campaign, just test an ad set that's like just 18 plus or 21 plus and see how that does. It will probably be one of your, your best performers. That's interesting. Uh, one more quick question before we continue. Uh, you mentioned that you guys had started work early in the year, January, February. Um, can you give us just a rough idea for how big the list was then and roughly what the ad budget was? And the reason I'm asking, you can keep it pretty rough, but the two most common questions that I get related to paid ads is when do I know I'm ready to start experimenting with paid ads? And like, what, what should my budget be? And I know you've got some more specific recommendations on like daily budgets, but just ballpark, how, should, how would people even know if this conversation is pertinent to them, which they'd be looking for in their own list? Yeah, some of the things we did for the Milk Road may not apply to every newsletter out there, but Sean and Ben had really ambitious growth goals. They wanted to hit 1 million in one year. So to do that, we wanted to start doing paid ads immediately. Whereas for a lot of newsletters, it might make sense to wait till you have 10,000 or even 50,000 subscribers and you're really monetizing your list and have like a sense of what the LTV is of a subscriber before you do paid marketing. Mm -hmm. um, but they wanted to grow quickly and like they knew they were gonna monetize and they knew they were gonna grow. So we started paid ads immediately. I think when we started, Sean had just done like a promotion to his email list, which was about like 40 or 50K. And we, they had maybe about 10 people that went over and joined the milk, 10K people that joined the milk road. Um, so that's kind of where we started in like February. The first week of February was about 10K. And um, I think it, almost immediately after that, we started growing with ads, all types of other marketing, and then also selling ads in the newsletter to start monetizing and making back that money almost immediately. Um, nice. so yeah, so to, to jump into the final component of a Facebook ad campaign is creative. So we have campaign type, targeting, creative, and what worked best for the Milk Road. And what I see the same thing across almost all the other newsletters I work with are these kind of four different types of creative. So number one is memes. We can't show memes on a podcast, of course, but you can go look at Facebook ad libraries for the Milk Road, look at other newsletters like The Hustle and see what types of memes they're using. These were great. They're not like necessarily funny memes, but they grab attention. We try and show a benefit of the newsletter with a meme and that gets people to sign up. So for people that want to find memes, there is a site I think called IMG Flip. If you just Google search meme templates, you'll find this site and you can scroll through literally thousands of different meme templates and get ideas for ones that work for your newsletter or your product. So this is a great ad category. This is like maybe most of the signups came from, from memes, at least at some point. We kind of slowed wow. that down a little bit later. Um, second type of ad creator that works is TikTok style or UGC style videos. So vertical videos, usually less than 30 seconds, sometimes less than 20 seconds. Um, these are also a little bit hard to explain without actually watching one, but the, like the, the framework I use to create these is we wanna have like a hook in the first five seconds that gets people's attention. We want to show the benefit of a newsletter or show how the newsletter solves a problem that the reader has. We want to show social proof and authority. So, hey, 10,000 people read this newsletter. Employees from Amazon, Meta, and um, Apple read this newsletter, so you should too. Um, so that's social proof, that's authority. And then finally, of course, you want to have a call to action at the end, and that could just be click the link to subscribe for free. Um, and then another caveat is you want to mention, if it, if it is free, you should mention it's free, obviously. <laughs> Oh, okay. That's kind of my like four or five step framework for video ads. And if you look at examples of that from other newsletters, you'll kind of see that, that formula. So that's what we used for, for our video style creatives. We use like, we found people on like Fiverr. We found people who are micro influencers. We found people who are like pretty cheap. We only paid maybe 80 to hundred dollars per video. And they're just shooting like selfie style videos, talking about the newsletter. We add on some very simple edits and we use that as an ad. So those work really well. 
Um, and then the, the final one, I think there's, there's two more styles of creative that I recommend. And that is um, literally just like write some good copy in your iPhone notes app, take a screenshot of that and use that as an ad. So we did a lot of that for the Milk Road. We do that for other newsletters too. It doesn't have to be iPhone notes. It could be Notion. It could be you just make it in Canva and it's just like a white or black background. Um, you could write it on a legal pad and take a, um, take a, what's it? Image of that. Take a, I can't talk here. You know what I mean? So take an image. <laughs> a photo? It has an app. It's, it's pretty simple, but I can't explain it. Um, so that that's a great performing app because you just explain like why the newsletter is awesome. Use some social proof, use some authority, have a call to action written down there. And that works great as an ad. And then the final type of creative format we use is testimonials. So this is hard for people who don't have any testimonials yet. So I don't, I won't talk a ton about this, but basically we ask people to provide a testimonial on Twitter. Um, we take a screenshot of that, use that as an ad, mm -hmm. um, same thing. People reply to our email. We take a screenshot of that and use that as an ad. Very simple. Uh, can I ask two tactical questions about that? How do you make that ask? And then are you checking with people before using it as an ad or what, what does the actual follow-up look like? Is there, is there any red yes. tape people if need to know about? Private, yes. If it's like a public tweet, we didn't. And it, I don't know the, the complete rules around that. I think that public private framework probably probably works for most things. A lot of times if, you're, if your content's really good, you'll just be getting them without even asking, which is great. But what I would do is like put out a tweet and like ask people what they think of the newsletter or can they provide a review? And then they can reply in the thread, ask for a reply in the thread. And then also you want to share that tweet in your newsletter. So people have visibility there too. So that's what, I think we did something similar with Milk Road. I've seen lots of other newsletters do something like that. And you'll get hopefully many replies, but even from small newsletters, I see they get like five or 10 replies and those work great. You know, what's interesting about all four of these to me is that they're all very informal. Do you have any theories on why informal ad creative works so much better than like custom illustrations or like, you know, professional photography or anything like that? I think the idea is that it's something you might see organically. And so the, like our whole philosophy is we don't want our ad to look like an ad. We want it to look like something you would see wherever we're showing it, your Facebook mm -hmm. feed, your Instagram stories, whatever. So we try and do that, with the ad. And yeah, so I think that kind of like breaks people's patterns because people know what an ad looks like. They know like what fonts advertisers use. They know what layout, they know what image an advertiser might use. And they kind of have mental, um, like a block on that as soon as they see it. So these small details are really important, even though the ad looks simplistic, using certain fonts, certain layouts, not using a logo in the ad can all help it perform a lot better. Um, even though if on the outside, it looks like you spent five minutes on it, even though we did in a lot of cases, um, that does help a lot. And then also like the follow-up to that is the brand Sean and Ben built was very informal and like very scrappy. They didn't make mm -hmm. a logo they until they had a hundred thousand subscribers. So it fit the brand too. So it kind of, the ad carried over to the, the landing page and to the content and it all kind of fit together in a nice way. It's so interesting how that happens. You know, like how, how people create mental blind spots for advertising after a certain amount of time. Uh, I think that's like a really under appreciated and underestimated aspect of audiences in general that like their ability to detect and filter out bullshit. Uh, I have like two more questions for you. I know we're coming up on time here, but one, I just wanted to drill a little bit deeper on budget because you had said something really interesting here. Um, in a tweet thread, you wrote a tweet that about this approach, which we'll link to in the show notes. So people who are interested, Matt laid out like all basically all this information plus some visual examples and stuff like that. What you said, uh, I'll just read the, the tweet about budget in full. So it says budget. You don't need a fortune to run FB ads. For starters, your daily budget in an ad set should be set to 30 to $50. And then you say $30, but that's low, except it isn't. For your ads to be optimized, you need a minimum of 50 conversions per week. With a CPA of about $4.20, you'll get 50 plus conversions per week with a $30 daily budget. And that's just hypothetical. In reality, your CPA should be well below 420. Can you explain this one sentence to me for your ads to be optimized you need a minimum of 50 conversions per I didn't week do a great that job agreeing to that because i had to be concise but there's something in facebook called the learning phase and basically your your ad set needs to have 50 or more conversions per week to exit the learning phase and i actually don't remember the exact terminology around what they define as learning phase but it's basically facebook is showing your ads to people 
and every conversion you get, they're going to show that ad to more people like the person that converted or in a similar situation as that person. There's all types of factors here. So you need to get a certain number of conversions for your ads to even really work at a high level. And so that's why you need to have a minimum budget. You can't spend $1 per day and have successful ads, but you don't need to spend $100 per day for something like a newsletter where you can have a low acquisition cost below $4, you know, $30 per day is, is enough to start with. So that's awesome. I don't need a huge budget. It's, it's not nothing, but it's not gigantic. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for breaking that down. And I think for people listening, like that gives you a pretty good um, window into what that minimum is too. So 50, 30 to $50 a week for a particular ad set. Uh, how many ad sets do you think you need to start off with? Can you do this with just one to just start? One. If you're like, a, okay, so you're talking, yeah. Uh, or sorry, 30 to 50 per day for ad set. That's 250 a week, a thousand bucks a month. If you have a thousand dollars a month to throw at ads, you can start experimenting. Yeah. That's Although what to start with. Um, yeah. But yeah. just to caveat it again with what Matt said earlier, like a lot of people will wait until they know a little bit more about what the lifetime value is of those readers. Otherwise you might just be throwing money out the window. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's right. And Ben kind of broke this down in another post that that was written that like he, I think he said that they had around like a, they got around 50 cents per subscriber per month from their sponsorship revenue. And he wanted to pay back the ad cost in about three months. So he wanted their ad costs to be well below $2 to, to get that payback period, like un under three or four months. So that's something you want to develop as you grow your list, and as you get sponsors or you monetize in another way. You want to have an idea of like your LTV, your payback period. So you know, when you spend $2 on a subscriber from Facebook, you can get back that money in you know three, four, whatever time period um, that that backs out to. So it's something to keep track of for sure. Awesome. All right, last question for you, which is uh, now that you guys have had this great outcome, and you can sort of look back with the benefit of uh, hindsight, is there anything you think you would try differently? Like what would what what would you change if you were going to do this all over again? Yeah, that's a good question. Let's see. I think. You know, one thing I talked to, and I've heard um, Austin from Morning Brew on a few podcasts, and talked about don't focus on lowering your acquisition cost by 10x, focus on raising your LTV by 10x. And that's one thing that um, the milk court is really brand new. Um, that's one thing we didn't do a great job of the hustle either, is our LTV was too low. And Morning Brew has kind of done the opposite, where they have a super high LTV. They have so many different newsletters and products, online courses. They're able to pay more for a subscriber and grow faster because the LTV is much higher. So at the Milk Road, our LTV was pretty low because we were just doing sponsorships. We were making 50 cents per subscriber per month. Um, so it's not a ton. So like I would create more products and they may do this later on. They actually are. Create more products to raise that LTV. Um, things like online courses, reviewing. Um, if you look at the milkroad.com now, they have like reviews for other different products that they make affiliate commissions from, which raises LTV. So we're able to go and spend more money on a subscriber, grow faster and make that money back faster, quicker potentially. Than we were before so that's one thing that's not the like when you're just starting out maybe you can't do that but that's something you want to focus on over time rather than trying to go from a two dollar cpa to like a one dollar cpa it's never really going to happen um but you can raise the amount of money you make from subscribers fascinating also i can Are, go over like five minutes if we want to and just kind of cover a few more things but oh okay well perfect if, if that's the case i had planned to stop there but what is there anything else that you really want to One share about this experience? Is like we just talked about pay growth and there's a lot more than that for the milk road mm -hmm. a lot more that creates an acquisition that i wasn't super involved in there's there's generating revenue by selling ads there's creating a brand there's creating awesome content so all of those factors were in place including paid growth which made it so successful so quickly so this is just one aspect of a whole it is important um so that's one thing to keep in mind like go back and look at the content look at the brand, like there's lots of things to learn um, from the milk road outside of just paid marketing for sure. Definitely. Yeah. This is something that we've talked about a couple of times on this show. Uh, obviously with your last interview, uh, Tim and I also broke down the milk road at one point, I think bef maybe before your interview as well. And the voice is one of the things that stood out immediately. The voice character, it's hard to replace that. And I think, you know, one one place where I see people people make a lot of mistakes is they'll jump into paid growth thinking that it's sort of a cure all. When the reality is, if you don't have great content, you know your paid growth is is a short term fix at the best, right? So, how do you see those two things working together, like uh, voice and paid growth, in terms of keeping people around? 
yeah, because if they don't open the email and they don't stick around, you're never going to be able to monetize them in whatever way you're monetizing. So it's super important. You don't necessarily have to have a newsletter with an extremely unique voice like the Milk Road does. I work with newsletters that are more like curations and they're just done tons and tons of bullet points. Like if you look at execsum.co is a good example of that. They have super high um, engagement, some of the highest I've ever seen, but there's no, there is a voice to the newsletter, um, but it's mostly curation. It's not original content. Um, so it's not entirely necessary, but also like, I feel like, and I've, I've kind of talked to the people who acquired the Milk Road a little bit. And one of the reasons they acquired it is because they felt like their voice was so unique. It was becoming like the voice of the crypto industry mm. that, I mean, that's, that's not quite a, like a mathematical reason to acquire it, but it's a psychological reason and a, and a marketing positioning reason that makes it more valuable, um, as a business than just if you were a curated newsletter. So something you don't have to have, but it definitely helps to have. And it's something that you develop over time, um, like the first few newsletters, they had like a funny cheeky tone, but it, it definitely got better over time. So you don't have to have something um, totally unique at first. And I think one thing to look at is like, look at what everybody else is doing in your niche, kind of do the opposite of that. So a lot of crypto news coverage was super dry, super boring, super analytical. If you look at like Coindesk and Blockfolio, I forget some of the other ones, CoinMarketCap has a newsletter. And it was not super exciting and they basically just did the opposite where they made it fun, concise, and like almost like, um, like full of memes and even a little offensive in some cases mm -hmm. uh, and people are really attracted to that. So it doesn't have to be like some crazy groundbreaking thing. Um, you can just do something different that other people aren't doing. Right. And there's lots of opportunities for that in so many different industries where everybody wants to be just like sound smart but mm -hmm. it just actually sounds boring. So you can flip it on its head. Totally. And I think there's always going to be opportunities for it too. Like what, one of the hardest things to maintain is exactly what you just said, like that fun kind of lighthearted voice, because as the company becomes more mature, as the audience gets bigger, as the stakes get higher, it introduces a lot more complexity into writing that way. And so I feel like just having been in the space long enough, I feel like, there will always be new opportunities to be a fresh voice in like, no matter what industry you're in, because even the, whoever like came in years ago, they, they evolve, they change. And, and at a certain point they're, 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 they're not talking to the same audience or they're not talking in the same way that, that they were even in the beginning. I mean, the, the obvious version of this is the hustle. So we have definitely evolved over time from like a scrappy little newspaper or newsletter that was being written in somebody's, apartment to now the media arm of a like multi-billion dollar company. And if you go back and read the differences between some of the old newsletters and the new ones, I think we've done a pretty good job of maintaining some of the curiosity that like started the newsletter. Um, but like there will always, always, always be an opportunity to step into a space with a fresh voice, you know? Yeah, totally. And people don't all, especially the bigger media outlets, people just don't trust as much. Like trust is fragmenting. So there's opportunities to sprout up and start something new in media. That's like more of a macro trend um, mm. than just that. But yeah. Even boring industries. Like I like, oh, what's that? Uh, there's like a bankruptcy law newsletter. I think uh, I've seen this. Yeah. I don't know petition. I think it's called Petition. And it's, yeah, it's exactly the same thing. It's It's like the hustle, but for bankruptcy law. And it's hilarious. It works every single time. Just take whatever your industry is, insert memes, and you get success for the most part. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, man. Well, this was awesome. So thank you for coming in here. We're going to have to get you back for a part three at some point. Word on the street is there's a podcast coming with you and Ryan Carr. For people who don't know those names, like, I mean, obviously you all know Matt now, but Ryan Carr is another growth expert in the newsletter space. So very, very excited to hear that one come out. Uh, anything else you want people to check out while you're here? That's all, man. I'm publishing a lot more on Twitter um, at J Matthew McGarry. So if you want to see stuff like breaking down the stuff we talked about in more detail, well, that would be a good place to check out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming in, man. And huge congratulations again to you and the team. This was very well executed. And I think it's going to go down as a really cool case study in the industry of like what this can really look like. So yeah. congratulations. I'm good to see you. Likewise, man. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. We will catch you next time. Hope this was helpful. And you know, Hit us up on Twitter if you have questions. We'll get Matt back in here. Later.